Yes. So are you ready for some good news? The gospel is beautifully simple and the truth shall set you free. I see a lot of muted faces and that's okay, but can we repeat together the most popular verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But wait, there's more. Jesus came not only to give us life beyond the grave, he intended to give us life, how to live right now. He said, I come that you might have life and you might have life more abundantly. And the truth is most of Christendom is carrying around a bucket load of unnecessary burdens that prevent life more abundant. Now, is it okay for us to be vulnerable here? Um, have you ever been publicly humiliated? And now let's clarify, there's a difference between embarrassment and humiliation. And this message is about Jesus, but I can share some humiliation stories but I want to differentiate them with an embarrassing moment. Um, I'm hoping y'all have seen the American sport of basketball, a hoop, a basket on a backboard. Um, I never played it well, and I was on the Baptist Student Union team at Kansas State College, and I was just a big, tall guy that made it hard for the other guys to shoot and get around. But I spotted something happening and I dashed just as they were passing the ball and I intercepted and there was nothing between me and the basket. And I'm dribbling down for all I'm worth. Nobody's within five meters of me. And I can hear everybody screaming and yelling. All I have to do is go do this wonderful little layup and bounce the wall, the ball off the backboard. And it's in the net. We score two points. Great, wonderful. As I dribble down and I do my layup, the ball bounces off the bottom of the backboard comes back, hits me in the head, and goes out of bound. It was the most epic display of incompetence that I could imagine, and I'd done it myself. It was embarrassing. Humiliation is landing gear up. Um, let's go back to high school. I've not really thought about the impact these two events have had on my life until recently. I had just moved to a new, um, moved from Houston, Texas to St. Louis, Missouri. And it was the fall of the year when the Warriors would go out and do battle upon the football fields, not soccer. Um, um, I think y'all may call it gridiron, but you have an offense and defense. You hit each other. You tackle each other. It's the um, it's the modern day equivalent of gladiators, I guess. But um, I was good enough to find myself as a starter on both offense and defense which meant I was expected to play the whole game. And before you become awed at my athletic prowess and my physical greatness, it's important to know 
one important fact, and that is this team had not won a football game in three years, a three-year drought of winning a game. Now, it's the first game of the season. It's halfway through the second of four quarters, and I've been playing the whole game. We are losing, not all my fault, but I hear Stephen on the sidelines saying, Tex, I want to come in. I want to come in. Well, thinking the coach was sending him in, I went to the sidelines and let Stephen come in and play, and I could catch my breath. Well, a few plays later, the coach discovers that I'm on the sidelines, and what are you doing here? Well, I I thought you sent Stephen in to play for me. I didn't send Stephen in. You're nothing but a quitter. You're not playing the rest of the game. Well, that was a misunderstanding, and I was being penalized it. However, at halftime, we kind of take a break, and the coach gets to rally his troops, and we were being defeated soundly, and he was saying, stay in the fight. Don't give up. Do not be a quitter like Tex. And the mantra through next week's practice, we lost the game. We lost a big time. um, Was we stand a chance to win this next game, but don't be a quitter like Tex. Now it's the second game of the season. It's an away game. We rode the bus to the opposing field, and somehow I'd redeemed myself, and I was starting still. I was going to play, and this particular game, I I played the entire game. I did not come off the field. I had a, a couple of really good plays where I broke up some situations that the other team could have scored. It was a close game, but we won our first game in three years. The team had won. Understand that. First win. The curse had been lifted. The team was jubilant, none more than I, because the quitter had been killed. Killed. We got on the bus excited to return to campus with the great news. Well, I found myself seated behind the four cheerleaders that came and in just the excitement, exuberance, I was teasing, being a bit flirtatious. Um, And if you knew me back then, I kind of talked nonstop. I was talking to my teammates. I was talking to them enough so that It must have annoyed the coach. He hollered out, Tex, take it easy. And a quiet hush fell over the bus. And if if you knew me back then, give me an audience with something that I can interrupt um, uh, that captive audience, the silence, I had to think of something funny to say. And so I said something funny. The whole bus erupts in laughter. And I'm thinking, I'd scored. We won our first game in three years. The whole bus is laughing because of something I said. The coach, however, suffered from a deplorable lack of sense of humor and He went ballistic, volcanic with his anger. He stood up screaming something about immaturity, inappropriate, and everyone who laughed was just as guilty. And he said, I don't want to hear another peep out of any of you the rest of the bus ride home. And when we get back to the school, I don't want you saying a thing as you get off the bus 
You're going to go to the football field and do four laps around the field before you go to the locker room. And the bus arrives at the school in dead silence. There's a small crowd awaiting the bus. How did you do? What was the score? And they watch silently as everyone, without a word, got off the bus, put their helmets on, and headed to the field to make laps. When the cheerleaders finally got off the bus, um, wow, they must have really done badly. Well, no, actually, they won. They won their first game in three years. What? They win their first game in three years and they're running laps. What happened? And they said, Ask Tex. That was my nickname. So for a week, I had been the reason we lost. And now, in the midst of what should have been jubilation, I was the cause of extra laps. And I was not well loved when I got to the locker room. And I consider that humiliation. And I don't know what events occurred or circumstances that happened in your life that planted a seed of shame in your life. But this I know, it starts early. Maybe parents divorce, a failing grade in school, absentee father, something someone said, or maybe it was something someone did not say, but they should have. Some neglect. Um, how and when it started is usually forgotten as the world in a myriad of ways constantly says, shame on you. And the average Christian carries this unnecessary load of brokenness and shame in their lives. Yes, we live in an imperfect world. The radio and TV commercials, billboards as you're driving, they're all proclaiming use this product or you're insufficient. You're not good enough. And our own life experiences, we know there's been planted a seed of shame. As it grows, it festers a pain. And then we develop unhealthy coping skills, addictions to medicate that pain. And the unhealthy addictions range from alcohol to overeating to pornography. All of these unhealthy addictions create a shame all their own. But there is a verse in the Bible that many of us have been waiting our entire lives to hear for the first time again, a verse that we've been waiting our entire lives to hear. Romans 8 verse 1 is a verse the church is still needing to fully understand. Romans 8 1 is a verse the world around us needs to hear, a verse proclaimed by the church and a verse proclaimed by us. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let that sink in. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, the skeptics among us may ask, how could Paul be so convinced? And perhaps Paul's own experience from the Damascus Road, um, likely Christ's tone of voice as 
he met Christ and heard his voice, Christ was not saying, now what do you think you're doing, Paul? Instead, it was more of a gentle, soft, it's tough to kick against the goads, isn't it, Paul? You're finally starting to see the whole picture. I know it's difficult for you, Paul, but you're going to make it. The softness that he experienced, the, the fact that someone he would normally have imprisoned came and ministered to him and the scales fell off and he could see again. Or perhaps Paul was convinced that in Christ there was no condemnation because later on in Acts, a few chapters, we, we read that Paul goes to Jerusalem and he meets with the disciples. And maybe, just maybe, Paul met John, the disciple John, who Jesus loved. And John may have told Paul about a book that he was writing, um, a book he was writing about the life of Christ. And he was saying, Paul, there's there's a really good chapter in, um, in, in the book, chapter three. There's a verse there that I think is going to be pretty popular with the whole world. And, and, you know, maybe, just maybe, Paul might have met Nicodemus while he was in Jerusalem. And I imagine the conversation might have gone something like this. Nicodemus, what? what was your experience with Jesus? And, he, and Nicodemus would say, Paul, I, I went because I had questions and I got answers, but they just created more questions that I'm still thinking about. This, you have to be born again. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty clear now, Paul, on what Jesus mission was he was sent to save the world and and John's real happy with with his verse 16 in chapter 3 but the life changing moment for me Paul was when I heard Jesus say and God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather to save it. Jesus did not come to condemn. That would have been Nicodemus's testimony to Paul. So Paul's own experience, his experience of hearing it from Nicodemus, and maybe John also told him, about another chapter he was writing in his book, chapter uh, chapter eight, and and you know, maybe just maybe, Paul might have bumped into Mary when he was in Jerusalem, a and Mary would have said something like this to Paul: "Paul, I was so terrified. I had not." acted alone, but alone I was being accused. I felt helpless, like a worthless pawn in a greater drama, but I learned in the presence of Jesus, my accusers are silenced. In the presence of Jesus, my accusers are silent. Jesus the incarnate word said not a word. Jesus, the word became flesh. Jesus, who formed us out of the dust, wrote words in the dust. And I discovered that even when Jesus is silent, Jesus is still Savior. And then Jesus speaks. And he makes a simple statement. Let him who is without sin cast the first 
stone. And there was quietness. And I heard footsteps. And I looked up and the accusers are gone. Paul, my Jesus is a single sentence savior. With one sentence, my accusers not only were silenced, they were gone. And then I looked up and I heard the most life changing, profound words I've ever heard. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And, and it was impressive that just the fact that Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, it, it gave me power not to go and sin again. Sin took on a new perspective. The lie was revealed. Sin was no longer pleasure. It was painful. And when he said, neither do I condemn you, the freedom was instant. The burden that was lifted was enormous. The shame was gone. The shame was lifted. It was as if Jesus had said to me, shame off you. The world so wants to shame us and condemn us, but that's not my Jesus, Paul. My Jesus is a single sentence savior. My Jesus is a non-condemning savior. My Jesus lifts the shame. And someday, Paul, I bet someone's going to write a song, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary, because mine surely was. And perhaps while Paul was in Jerusalem, he might have heard testimonies from others who actually witnessed the crucifixion, saw Jesus die, and he knew the crucifixion was the most shameful, humiliating means to perish. You hang there naked, openly shamed, mocked by many. And yet as Paul thinks about it, he writes, Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. In other words, he refused to accept the shame. He allowed, he did not allow others to define who he was. Others may say he's a fraud. He's not who he says. He's blasphemous. But Jesus knew. And Paul, not only saying, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who were in Christ Jesus. A few chapters later, Paul says, and anyone who trusts in him, that is Jesus, anyone who trusts in Jesus will never be put to shame. We may have embarrassing moments. We may have people who try to humiliate us but we don't have to accept the shame they're trying to put on us. The Holy Spirit may come and convict us of sin, but conviction of sin is entirely different from condemnation. It's as, it's as if God is the judge, then our role must be to love. By implication, if we are going to be Christ-like in our behavior, in our speech, we will not be condemning either. So, how do we wrap these up? 
Psalm 32, verse 10. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Mercy, I think, is a tremendous antidote to shame when circumstances cause us to feel that way. So, long-winded way of saying this simple phrase that I can proclaim to you in full confidence as if I was the personal representative of the Holy Spirit, that a prophet who could proclaim a thus saith the Lord, Jesus, in everything he does for us, is saying, shame off you. May shame that you're feeling be lifted and eased. May guilt that plagues you be removed from your life. There is still a journey. And as Mary would have testified to Paul, she would have said, Paul, yes, I have a past, but now I have a future in Jesus Christ because my shame has been lifted. We all have a future in Jesus Christ because the shame, the condemnation does not have to be a part of our life. And that is the gospel. Now I'm quiet. Where do we go from here, Mr. Host? Thank you all for listening. I hope we'll get to see you tomorrow morning. It will be a follow-up to this. If we then have been resolved of shame, resolved of condemnation, how then should we behave? And a happy Sabbath to everyone. Yes, I'm quiet now.